Sharing desktop. Dan cannot hear. This is the box we chat in. Hang on, Dan. I'll get back to you in a minute. Chat. Okay. Um, Dan, try reconnecting. Okay. So now we can kind of do an official disclaimer, although we're going to make it a lot bigger than that. Access to this webinar for educational and informational purposes only. Consult the licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trade. All securities and orders disclosed, discussed, to track, tomorrow, and virtual trading, accounts, virtual accounts, prices, may, and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are included. Need to fill stock rope, PSM. W North Philly Committee, the respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors, all in such capacities, licensed financial advisors, business investment advisors, or broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar website or promotion material constitutes promotion recommendations, solicitation or offer of any legal investment security or transaction. Trading options are all three. Visit the OCC website, www.optionclearing.com, to read the characteristics of standardized options. PSW provides educational and training services that meant to seek clear and potential rewards and escape from trading options. And we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you can afford to lose. Test points will not equal future results. And results of this webinar are not critical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary by access in this webinar. You agree to hold the above along as many losses you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By access in this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right. How are we doing, guys? Now, let's move along. Um, everybody can see my desktop, yes? And really, guys, if you don't participate, how am I going to know you're there? Um, moving right along. Okay, so nobody's talking, really? Did I lose you guys? Somebody, anybody? I don't want to at least watch video. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Hey, <laughs> now I feel like we're interacting. All right. <laughs> cool. Okay, good. All right. Well, look, this is a fantastic chance for someone to ask me a question. Look at the personal attention you're getting here. Say something. All right. Somebody asked me um, about, is he here? That's a yes, thing. I'm going to start answering questions if someone's not here. That would be silly. Um, who the hell did? Options Alpha said on the webinar, can you teach what you saw this morning in the stock future? Are you there, Options Alpha? Oh, okay, Rich. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so what did I see this morning? <laughs> My first question is, what the hell did I see this morning? You mean when I, when I wanted to go long? Is that what we're talking about? It wasn't just what I saw, although I saw this. I mean, look at these lines. Look how 105, see it held up at 10, what's that, 10, 15? Little up here, but this is a nice consolidation. You've got this little range here. To get the, the green line, let's talk about this range. These little dots, these dots, 105 and 110. All right, so we had a little consolidation. You know you're going to get rejected on 110. Okay, 110 was a very big line for us. We've been watching it for like a week or more than a week, okay? So if you slip below 110, when the when the um, you slip below 110 when there's not a lot of trading, like in after hours, and the volume is going to be thin, right? And then you try to get back over 110, but you can't. You kind of have to give it a little bit of a um, you you got to give the you got to give the index a little bit of time because you you consider it like a tough opponent like that one ten line is a tough opponent and there's not enough volume after hours for it to get over it so the fact that it doesn't get over it isn't a sign of weakness it's just a sign that one ten is a legitimate support slash resistance line it's gonna you know support line acts as resistance going the other way um, so. In the low volume rally, I didn't consider the, the failure of 110 to be a negative sign. I just considered it to mean that it's going to need uh, a better reason of it to rally than what it had at, at, at you know, whatever time this was, at 120 in the morning. All right? And what's going on at 120 in the morning? Only Asia is up. I looked at Asia's results. They didn't have a strong day. In fact, Japan looked like crap. So who's really buying it? Who's going to buy enough to shoot it over the 110 line? So 
from a waiting perspective in my mind, I kind of discount that a bit. Also, I knew that the last thing Asia had seen was Obama uh, talking about, um, you know, bomb, you know, we're bombing Iraq with the uh, planes and we're dropping food on the um, Kurds who are stuck where they all were stuck. And, um, but that's not war. It sounds like war, but it's not war. It's just us doing what we can easily do. It's not, it's not, it's not a risk to American lives to fly our supersonic planes over their thing and kill a few Iraqis. That's easy. We can do that with our eyes closed. I mean, we got kids like sitting in Ohio that can do that with remote control. Um, so that's not war. Okay. That's, it's, a, it's just a step over a drone attack. Um, so it's an overreaction. So, you know, so Asia was overreacting to the downside and come as Europe wakes up, they have a better understanding of, um, of what America is doing than, than Asians will. And they've got a, a better handle on the situation in the Middle East than Asia does. It's further from them. It's just a fact of life. We have less of an understanding than Europe does because uh, it's further from us. So, they, so as Europe wakes up at 3 a.m., see here, 3 o'clock trading, 3.30, and four, and Europe starts buying because they say, they assess the situation and say, this isn't such a big deal. That volume gives them enough to get the Russell over. And then the coolest thing here is once it got over, it stayed over. So here I am waking up in the morning and I'm watching 110 acting like support. All right, so when I see 110 acting like support, I got all excited and I said to people, and I forgot what time I said it, but I know I said it, uh, da, 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 da. Okay. okay, and this is really just like Tuesday when I said, don't be a sucker because we were weak down, Sam. You just got to, um, you got, you can't just look at a chart. You got to take the whole thing into context, like what's the dollar doing, what are the other indexes doing, what's the sentiment, you know, and you got to take all those things into account, not just like one data point. All right, so this morning. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here's me waking up. So by the time I said it, it was 6.45, because I was doing my news. Okay, so uh, the, the, uh, the TF already went over, and they were over getting over 110. And so uh, it's again, oh, and that goes back to the same thing. It's like if you're watching an index and it's confirming a bullish move, then you look and say, hey, I want to short the laggard. Who's lagging that index and who's going to catch up? So then I saw ES exactly at that, by the time I made the comment, <clears throat> I mean, I woke up, I don't know, about 5.30 or so, and I started reading. Um, I don't know when I started posting, 5.45, 5.42. All right, so by 5.40, I was posting stuff. So, you know, I've been up for, um, over an hour by the time I get around making comments, but that's what I do. I digest the information. I mean, there's nothing urgent that has to be traded. It's just a matter of like, let's read all the news first. This is, I mean, this is the process I go through. I read all the news first. I decide which weighting the market should have after looking at the good and the bad from what's been going on while I've been sleeping. And, um, and then I try to highlight for you guys in the morning, I try to highlight what I consider significant. And at the time, that's what I thought was significant. The Nikkei dropped 200 points. And, but the Nikkei dropped because of the thing we talk about a lot is that the, the yen, you know, when you talk about currencies and where you invest in currency money, where you invest in, where do I invest in? I invest in dollars, euros, and yen, right? Maybe you talk about Swiss francs or pounds, but realistically, dollars, euros, and yen. But what people don't understand about that is that the dollar is – 65% of all the money in the world. And the euro is, is 20%. And my dollar might even be 70%. And the euro is like 20% of all the money in the world. So the dollar is three times bigger than the euro. The euro is 20%. The yen is not even 10%, like by, I'd say 8% of all the money in the world. But still, as an American, when you talk about allocating, you're going to allocate, you're not going to allocate, um, four times more euros than you will to get, right? You're gonna allocate maybe uh, maybe double euros and yen or something like that. But that's the thing, there's an over allocation into yen 
whenever there's a panic, because people who want to diversify their money go dollars, euros, yen. And if you're going dollars, euros, yen, the chance of you putting only 10% into yen is very slim, which means that anytime uh, uh, cash is being allocated, it strengthens the yen because people demand it. People are demanding yen. That's what causes overreactions in the yen. That's what drives, you know, Abi crazy in Kuroda. They're trying to freaking devalue the yen, and, you, and every time something bad happens in the world, people start buying the damn things again. No matter what they do, no matter how low, you know, they offer zero percent interest rates, and people still take them. It's just insane. Because how do you buy yen? Realistically, you don't buy yen. You don't go to the store and buy yen. You buy Japanese bonds, even though they have shit returns. That's how you convert your money into yen. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind, and we talk about it, you know, I mean, well, look, this, this is it. This is how we talk about it. You know, a lot of this is like when you take class in college. It's like you can't talk about the same stuff every day. It's like over the course of the time that you're taking the class, then we mention certain things. And every once in a while we do talk about the yen and why, how it affects things. So, so we'll get away from oil for a second. We'll look at Nikkei, NKD. All right, so the, so the yen shot up, and that tanked the Nikkei. That's all it is, too, is the thing. I mean, the Nikkei is all about exporters, and if the exporters have a weak yen, they're happy. If they have a strong yen, they're not happy. They can't sell their crap. Um, so I'm sorry. So back to the S&P, though. So at 645, oh, look at that. It was such a good call. <laughs> we were just getting over this line. Look at that, look at that perfect call. And I said the S&P is a lagger, but Russell at 645, wait, 645, so he was already getting over 645. Ah, so the Russell was already getting up towards 113. It was the S&P, though, and that's why I said the S&P, because it was a lagger. That's what I mean by lagger. In other words, it was not, the Russell had clearly popped. The S&P was still thinking about it. Well, if it's still thinking about it and he clearly popped, then I'm going to bet he's going to pop and catch up. And it was a beautiful call. Look at that. Man. Okay. And also, same thing on the Dow. I pulled the Dow, whatever line it was. And, that's, and I said, I don't think the Dow, the Dow would not cross 16.3. And I said, when the Dow crosses 16.3, it too will be good for a little ride. And that's exactly how it plays. All right. So when you're watching the futures, you know, watch a lot of things. Keep your prize of the situation. But in other words, so if something happens on news, you say, wow, that should probably knock the futures back. That's your premise. So if your premise is that should knock the futures back, then look the futures being knocked back. And if you see them being knocked back, you focus on three, four to watch. I don't recommend watching a ton of them in time. Here's my chart with everything. Well, not everything. Here's my chart with a bunch of stuff. But you, it, it's hard to concentrate when you're watching so many things. So. You know, I do click over here, here in reference, like, oh, I wonder what Donald's doing, I wonder what Gold is doing, I wonder what Silver is doing, I wonder what PLT is doing, I wonder what, here's me moving the chat box, you can't tell I'm doing it. That's XR, I don't really care about that anymore, around that trade. Here's what oil, gasoline, natural gas, this is my screen for watching futures, you know, to just get an idea of what the overall futures market looks like. <laughs> and Apple, Apple's like so important, I watch it anyway. So, you know, when you when you think something's happening, then you've got to pick, like, four things that you're going to watch closely to make your trade. And if you don't have four things to key on when you're making your trade, don't make your trade. You need the confirmation. You need to see that the things are going the way you thought. And so here you go. So making this trade on the S&P, let's say, right, we catch the pop here. It's still going up. At what time did the Russell show us the negative? The Russell was good up to the 1120 line, which is what I told you about the 1120 that I was probably going to top out. But you see how it's, it's jagging around 1120 here, and ultimately it doesn't quite make it. So essentially at 8 o'clock here, you could have called it a day because the Russell went over 120 and then failed it, then over, then failed it. So somewhere in the 8 o'clock hour, you call it a day. Now look at the S&P in the 8 o'clock hour. It's also topping out, but a little behind the Russell, because we know the Russell is a more active index. So the Russell gave us a really great early signal to, to top to kill that trade. So that's how we enter and exit. There you go. It's be very nice. Um, all right, how are we doing? Any more questions? That was the first one. <laughs> it, only took, it only took like 15 minutes. Well, that's actually kind of good that we're recording it, so that was worth something. Um, but, 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 but. 
So meanwhile, what do we see? Um, so at the moment, we're we're basically seeing weakness here, and and it makes sense. Now, now we get into the psychology of the thing. Is um, here we are on a Friday. There is war-ish talk, you know, and it's not just obviously Iraq. It's also Putin bullshit. So. Am I comfortable right now going bye 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 into the weekend like uh, all the CNBC people are doing? No, that's crazy. Anything could happen over the, it's a, you know, the weekend, two days, who knows what's going to happen. So why don't we just wait and see? And, and that's what we can do because we have balanced portfolios. We don't have any urgency to do something with our money. And by the way, don't forget, first of all, at this point, we balanced our portfolio at the top of the market, really. So we, we kind of maxed out our gain uh, for the position. Of course, we maxed it out because the, the, uh, the long-term portfolio is down uh, like $25,000 since the top. But the short-term portfolio is up $25,000. So it's okay. But we did essentially max out our gain in the long-term portfolio. That means that, if anything, we're kind of inclined to start taking positions off the table if the market gets worse, not just drive things out. We haven't, you know, we're not down 10% yet, so we're not even close to making a hard choice like that. Um, but we do need to think about what we're doing. And, and it gets to a point where we're not effectively balancing. And that's why it's very important to keep that count. And our count is 720 now on the, on the total of the, um, the short and long-term portfolio. And if the short and long-term portfolio uh, starts falling below 710, then I'm, I'm going to say, well, we're not protecting ourselves adequately. I don't want to lose $10,000. So I'd rather go to cash and, 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 and just look for things from scratch and lose 10000 bucks. So we either figure out how to balance ourselves better or we get some more cash. Uh, currently, our long-term portfolio is very, very, very bullish. So we're not really we're here have a little a little down, so it doesn't matter to us at all. In fact, frankly, all of our positions are pretty much so in the money that, uh, that, that you know it's, it's really a matter of time. Is it waiting time to pick off? It's not about the stocks going up anymore. They're pretty much where we expected them to be. But we expect them to be there at the end of the year, not now. Um, I don't know if we want to ride out a correction. We can engineer it with the short-term portfolio to try to ride out a correction. In fact, if we do a really good job. We can cash out. Like, let's say there's a big spike down on something stupid. We could cash out our short-term portfolio. Let's say it's 150, right, up 50%. We could say, well, 50%, that's a lot, and we can cash it out. We have 50,000 extra dollars. It's not really extra, though. Then the, the long-term portfolio will be down, down from the top, $50,000. But we could take the 50,000 cash, redeploy it into the long-term portfolio by buying more of the stuff that we like. And then when it goes back up, maybe it turns into $75,000 while the other positions in the long-term portfolio recover. But then we'd be taking a much uh, more aggressive bullish stance because we'd be taking away our protection from the short-term portfolio and adding to the long-term portfolio. So these are the kind of things we do all at once. These are very subtle things that we do, like this week we removed TZA and we removed our short USO positions, our SEO longs. We have been um, deep, like it's like playing Jenga. We're like taking out the pegs from our aggressive shorts because as we go lower, you know, we hit $35,000 in the short term portfolio for profit. As we get lower and we hit $35,000 on a little dip, we go, hmm, I'm kind of happy with that. Let's try to take a little of that off the table. All right, so let's take a look at those portfolios. Nobody has any other questions, and I don't see anybody talking to me. So. <laughs> That's probably doing too many webinars. It's boring, huh? Everybody's, uh, oh, yeah, you've been another webinar for a while. Uh, let's see. What was I going to do? Oh, yeah, portfolios. So, and I'm not going to do this for too long, guys, so uh, I'd say another half hour at the most because i got to get out of here. I'm going to Boston. Let's see. No weird, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, the, uh, the, yeah, the, they're hitting resistance here. So I, I, I don't know if I completed that thought, but um, 
you know, basically, I'm not expecting any kind of rally today because who the hell wants to be long in the thing? Where I'm being tail, I don't know the middle. <laughs> I'm going to stay at the Sheridan by the uh, back bay, and um, I'm I'm taking the kids up there too. So I'm going to stay at the back bay Sheridan. That's got a nice pool and stuff, and uh, it's, you know, you can walk around from there. And then my friend lives. He lives right by Copley. He lives like right in downtown. He's got a nice little town hall. And that's where the party's going to be tomorrow night. So cool. A lot of my college buddies are going to be there. It's going to be nasty. All right. Let's see what's going on. So short-term portfolio, back to being up 35%. And, yeah, I know, uh oh right? I'm 50 years old and we be drinking like I'm 20. <laughs> and so I had, especially with that crowd, because that's the Boston people. They drink like, damn, the sailors out there. Uh, let's see. So we're back to being up 35%, which is good because, uh, you know, we have a little, well, we're not a dip, we're flat. So that's kind of, no, that's not good. I take that back. I'm a little confused. Like, I got to really figure out our positions and like, why things are going um, a little weird. Like, we had sell off yesterday and we actually lost some money. Now we got our money back, but the market was up. So we're doing something wrong. We're not as bearish as I want to be in this portfolio. Now, a lot of it's Tesla, I think. I think I said that yesterday. But see, Tesla was down like nine yesterday on this position. Now it's down 72. Um, our new SDTY is, see that, um, it's, uh, it's, don't, now don't forget also these are terrible, um, these prices are your worst case scenario. It always gives you the bid, the ask, it gives you the exact opposite of what you want. Um, but at the moment it's, it's, it's a slight profit, but the bottom line for us is that we said they won't go higher than 7750 and they're at 7509. So we're good with this trade. We want these guys to be close. The, the you know the um, the bull call spread. We don't want it to too much money. It's this guy that we want to erode. And at the moment, they're not down very much. So I wouldn't take it off the table because it's on track. All right. It would have been nice if they dropped quickly and we could have uh, pulled the bull, pulled the short calls. You know, like let's say they were. Let's say we made three bucks, and that would have been. Um, no, nah, that wouldn't be much. It would be. Um, if, they, if we made three bucks each, it would have been fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, well, so for fifteen hundred bucks, I would have pulled them, right? Because I'm like, okay, that's fifteen hundred dollars. We'll take off the table, the profit, and then we could have maybe seen if the bull pull spread recovered and otherwise kill it. I, I mean, as long as they're making a thousand dollar profit, who's going to, you know, in a day, who's going to complain? But this is only up one twenty five at the moment. I'm sure if I took it off the table with good prices, we get about two fifty three hundred dollars instead of one twenty five. But you know, still it's on track, and I and I didn't see anything. I mean, look, I didn't see anything on that that really changed my mind about Solar City. It's not worth seventy five dollars. It's just not. It, it's it's based on insane valuations. I mean, you you tell them somebody's like thirty five times sales. So that's a bit crazy. Um, so Patrick saying the SCTY trade question is about when you would get out of the whole call spread and move in your direction. Okay, yeah. So this is on track. Okay, that's that's the key takeaway from this. It's on track. Not only is it on track though, but it's not a big commitment for us. It's in other words, it's um, you know, we shorted those, but what if it, what if it went over? If it goes over, our net on this trade was a, a credit. So we really don't even lose money until it's up to 95. And if it got over 80, we could easily double down on the spread because the spread isn't changing in value. In fact, it's cheaper now than when we took than when we took it in the first place. So the spread isn't changing in value. And if it actually goes up, we just double down on the spread, and then we're technically protected to um, 110. So unless I think SCTY is going to be higher than 110. In, in January, not, not now, but not ever, but I'm talking about January. If I don't, if I don't think SETY is going to go over 110 by January, I have nothing to fear from this trade. The only thing I have to do is take an action if it crosses over 80. But we're not, you know, since it's nowhere close, we have a, a pretty nice buffer, a safety zone. We have $1,500 in our pocket. See this net? So we got um, $7,575, right? And one, no, $7,000, boy, my math. $5,000. 75 less that with our credit, and um, so it's like an 800 and something dollar credit. So you're like an 800 and something dollar credit, and all we and, and it doesn't matter what SETY does as long as it 
prior is below 7750. So if we want the 850, we just have to wait. I mean, it would have been nice to get it fast, but so we're not going to get it fast. Now we'll get it slow, you know, hopefully anyway. Now, Arrow, oh, wow, I forgot we have so many in the short-term portfolio. Um, we talked about selling the $3 puts on Arrow, but I'm, uh, I certainly don't want to sell 100 $3 puts. That, would, that, that means we want to buy 10,000 shares of Arrow. Um, Arrow Postal. Gosh, no. I was, I was looking in the, uh, I don't know what the hell I was looking at. I was looking at 25 pages or something that happened in another portfolio. But in the, uh, the short-term portfolio, I do not want 100. I don't even want 50. Do I want 5,000 leads, 15,000? Do I want to make a, a $15,000 commitment by selling the short $3 uh, calls? I'm sorry, short $3 puts? Because that's what we were talking about. We were talking about selling these puts to 80 cents uh, to pay for this spread. But no, I think not. Um, the thing about Arrow is, it's, you know, look, they, they, they are priced like they're going bankrupt. I don't think they're going bankrupt, but you never know. And so we just priced them to recover. And we took the bull call spread because it gives them 18 months to work out their crap. If they don't work out their crap, and if they fall down to like 250 or something like that, whoa, what the hell is that? Oh, that's obnoxious. <laughs> Why would it make that sound? That's hard. Um, all right. So, uh, totally messed up my brain. <laughs> all right. So, um, here's the $3 line. If it gets down to like 250 we would have to really make a decision on the spread. But all it's doing now, oh, this is like the morning thing, though, right? All it's doing now is not hitting, not getting back over resistance. And, and think about the market conditions. It tried to get over the 50-day moving average, but the 50-day moving average was coming down, and that's not, that's not this week's fault. All right? So tell me if this doesn't make sense to you. I'm going to try to explain it. It's not this week's fault or this month's fault that the 50-day moving average is coming down. The 50-day moving average is coming down because of this. There was a big problem in May, the 50-day moving average here, and, and there was a problem here too, that two consecutive earnings reports that people didn't like. But it wasn't this earnings report isn't the one people didn't like. It was these earnings reports. This earnings report let people think, including me, because we only just now started buying the thing, this earnings report made people say, hey, this is not a bad price for these guys. They finally came to a point 250 million in market cap where I want to buy a company that does $2 billion a year in business. You're telling I, you know, I, it's, it's hard to get to $2 billion in sales. It's hard to get a name brand recognition. It's hard to have a 1,000 stores with staff and a, distribute, and a distribution system and so on and so forth. All those things are really hard to do, and they've done all that. And, and if I had to build a brand myself, if I wanted to build jeans and to push them out in the market, and I hired a marketing team, and I said, what's it going to cost me to get a 1,000 stores in a 1,000 malls around the country and staff them up with trained people and uh, have a distribution center and a warehouse and manufacturing facilities and all the trade agreements and have all the infrastructure in place to handle all that and get my jeans made in China and sent over by ship and come in the ports on both sides of the Atlantic Oh, well, actually, actually in the Pacific, sorry. I have to come to in LA and have the trucking company set up and have my uh, warehouse manager and hire all these people and put it all together and get it going. How, how can I do that? How fast will it, can I do it? How much will I spend? You think the guy's not going to tell me it's going to cost me $250 million and take me three years at least? i got to advertise the crap out of this thing. It costs $4 million for one minute on the Super Bowl or 30 seconds or whatever the hell they're selling. Um, you know, so, so think about that. Think about how hard it is to advertise to people, get people's attention, and the magazines, and the this and the that, and the sitting down with the people, and the visualization, and doing all this. You know, you compare that to tweaking a brand that already exists and, and changing it from Arrow, assuming I want to change from Arrow, but let's say I want to change it from Arrow to Trump jeans, right? Well, I change it from Arrow to Trump jeans by just uh, having one little design meeting. Everything else, distribution, all that is the same. And now I got my name on people's asses. 
So there you go. So you know, if you want to do that, it's easy. Um, and so, at a certain point, buying is cheaper than building, and that's and that's the point which I love to get involved in companies. It's like I can't figure out how to build this company for less money. I can figure out how to take this company and make them stop losing money. I can figure out how to improve what they've got. I can figure out things that they may be doing wrong in their store that I can improve. So therefore, I should buy it and use it and use what they've got. All right. So I'm at at seven, they weren't a buy. At five hundred million, they weren't a buy. But at three at two hundred, you know, not even about five hundred million. At um, whatever the hell, six hundred seven. Anyway, so at six hundred seven hundred million, they're not a buy. At five hundred million, they weren't a buy. We didn't buy them here. But when they get down to two hundred fifty million dollars, I'm like, Jesus Christ, what do you want? All right, it's like um. Like let's say there's an old uh, an old Mercedes convertible. I, I see these in Florida sometimes when I'm down with my mom. You see these old Mercedes convertibles, and sometimes they're like uh, you know if you want thirty thousand dollars, I'm like oh, I'm not interested. But if you want twenty thousand dollars, you say hmm that's kind of fun to have. And then you see one for ten thousand dollars, and it looks great, and and it's got not so bad mileage. You know it's like not new, but it's freaking ten thousand dollar Mercedes convertible. You know some old lady's been driving it around for like. 20 years and not have barely any use to it. Um, at a certain point, you have to say, gee, there's a deal. I want to buy it. And, and obviously, with a, with a, you know, purchasing an entire company, nobody's going to make that decision overnight. But I guarantee you that people sit there the same way I do with my feeling the Mercedes going around. It's like they're thinking about it. They're saying, yeah, I don't need it. I can get it. I have to ship it up home. I got to put it in my garage. I'm only going to use it in the summertime. I already have the Mustang. You know, I all these thoughts go through your head. <laughs> you know, and that's the same thing Eddie Lambert thinks about when he looks at the company like he's going, hmm. well, I've already got this brand and that brand, we already have that one and that one. I've got this shelf space, I gotta move it, we've got to change the warehousing, I'll still have to close down some of these stores, people will think I'm a bastard, uh, this and that. That's how it goes. All right, but eventually if the deal makes sense, the deal's gonna get done. All right, so again, this Earnings report caused the 50-day moving average to go down. This earnings report caused the 50-day moving average to go down. This earnings report didn't cause the 50-day moving average to go down, but it still has to deal with the declining 50-day moving average. Not only that, but the market was weak and tanking right when it tried to get over it. So I'm not going to penalize Arrow for failing the 50-day moving average. I'm not going to say, like most technicians are going to say, oh, look at that, they tried to hit the 50-day moving average and failed, that's a bearish signal. No, it's not. The market was making a bearish pull. The 50-day moving average is, of course, going to be resistance, and are we, it's not, it's not as weak bounce because we, didn't, we never got down below three. But to me, this is just, a, it's going to be, it's what you call a triangle squeezy thing. In other words, what's happening, if you can get this, I think $3 is real strong support, and what you're going to get is a real narrow thing that will eventually break up here and pop. All right, so that's how I feel about Arrow. It's just it's stupidly low at 250 unless they're going bankrupt. I don't think they're bleeding cash fast enough that they can't be saved. But ah, the big caveat here, though, is I do think they're going to have a dilutive event. I think they're going to have to sell some stock or do something or borrow. You know, somehow they got to raise some more cash. They can't get by on what they got right now. They might sell off some stores or do something drastic, but that's kind of tricky also to take time. So one way or another, there'll be something to ding the value a little bit more than where it is now. At that point, depending on what they do and how much cash they raise, I may be more interested in selling the put. But for now, I just would like my upside head, which we have. We have 100, pretty serious uh, bet. So we have 100 uh, contracts that I'm betting they're going to get back to this range. They're going to be back in the $350 to $5 range over the course of the 18 more months. So, that answers that question. <laughs> oh, boy. So it's been so hard to go through these portfolios. We're going to anyway, discuss these positions. So, it's a good thing. All right. So, short-term DXC, good head. We like it. I remember, the, you know, it's funny because, you know, we kept taking losses on these positions, and we rolled them and rolled them and changed them and whatever. And eventually, under the big fat DXD position, we took a loss for a while, but other positions that we had were making money, so our net in the portfolio was zero. But now that this one's come back, 
we got a nice fat $10,000 sitting on it. We we're down to like 5,000 at one point. So 15,000 of our gains is, is what we expect it to be. It's a DXD hedge. Um, the CMCR has been a disappointment. We're still trying to figure out what to do about them, but I still think they're going to go lower. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about those. Don't care about those. XQQ, another hedge. This one's working fairly well. It's up $5,000. You know, but these hedges weren't there to take advantage of a 5% market correction. These hedges are here to protect, protect us from a big correction. All right? We're not at a big correction. We're not even in the money on this trade. You know, we, we're not getting a big correction. And if we don't get a big correction, it means our long-term positions are fine, and therefore we don't need these hedges. It means that, you know, all the, you know, you don't want to take a loss. It's supposed to say, oh, we'll take a loss. But they're there to take a loss. That's the purpose of these positions. It's to protect the long-term portfolio. If we happen to make some profits, that's nice in the short-term portfolio. But its main function is to protect the long-term portfolio. So while the long-term portfolio lost $35,000 on this pullback, the short-term portfolio gained it, and what that means is we don't have to take our long-term portfolio trades off the table. That's all it means. It means we don't have to panic out of positions in the LTP. It means that should we decide that we have LTP positions we want to add to, we've got the cash right here. If we want to get more bullish, we're protected. We, you know, those the cash that looked like it let out of the long-term portfolio kind of moved to this one. Yahoo is still waiting for Alibaba. Win is exactly where we want it to be, and it's showing it now. Now we're up a bit, uh, 196. See, now we don't care. We got rid of those uh, short puts, and now we're just happy they're below 210. XRT, disappointing, but, you know, still up, 1,300 bucks. Um, I, would, I mean, don't forget, we just only care if it stays below 88, and when it's below 88, we will realize a full 5,000. 5, so currently it's up 1,300. Um, we'll get 5,000 in the end if it stays where we want to. So even though it's 100% in the money, it doesn't show us uh, much of a profit yet. Baidu, uh, that was just a play where we go, Baidu is overpriced. Fast, we were waiting. We expected it to bounce back. It is bouncing back, but not much. Um, probably around 22.50 on XLF. We're going to want to sell some more calls again. Facebook, no problem. So City, we talked about Silver Wheaton, no problem. That's our long-term silver play. And Tesla, uh, it's fine. You know, it's it's not a winning position at the moment. But you know, what we what we believe is going to happen is we're going to go back down, and right now they're 248. Done with that portfolio, and I really do have to get back to finishing stuff up. I don't see any new questions, so I'm going to finish up with the long-term portfolio now. Oh, below 17. Don't like it. But now they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Because the long-term portfolio went down a bit, like a four-tenths of a point. But the uh, short-term portfolio is back over 35. So we've got 584 plus 35, and we're right at um, 719, or figure 720 maybe with the chin. So we're right at the same place we were earlier. We're at the same 720, with the same 720 we started the week at. That's fine. All right, so what, what we really was in the long-term portfolio for is who do we want to add to? Who went down enough that we, that we think that they're too cheap? Eagle is a good one to look at. All right, why Eagle is taking such a hit, I don't know. Um, let's see if anything happened today. I mean, I can guess they're probably on the board of the bank. We'll feel like it. We'll ship it. Um, e G L A. Yeah, before we do that, I'll show you. I mean, look, you know. Here's the Baltic Dry Index, all right? You can't make any money if this is the rate you're going to get for your ship. It's too low. You know, don't don't forget, I mean, it's the same with the gold mine. It's like it, there's an amount where you break even. Let's say that amount's 1,000, right? So here's, here's where you're, you make money. But when it drops 20%, it's a loss, and it's a big loss, because that's where your profit needs to come from. But if it goes up 20%, that's your profit becomes huge. 
So if you look at this, he had a big low in January of um, 12. So now we're going to go EGLE. E -G. All right, and see they bottomed out there, and they bounce back, and they come down, and they go up. Now they're down. All right, so it's it's a little uglier this time. It's very nasty, but you see this two big stick, big stick down, big stick down, and even bigger stick down. But here we have kind of a big stick down, big stick down, flat. See how that pattern repeats? This pattern. All right, bigger stick down. So now you've got to figure out what is going on exactly. And they've got their prepackaged bankruptcy. Goes to the birds. <laughs> why is soaring? It's so funny. You're like, why is it soaring today? Why is the screen supposed to be? So the question is, when they come out of bankruptcy, when they go through bankruptcy, what are they going to do? So this is a um, company statement, creditors hold more than 85 percent loan, they go to the reorganization plan, um, lenders would receive all the stock in return for what they owed, if approved, it would cancel the company's stock, and you receive 5% of the stock, 0.5% of the stock, in a reorganized equal, equal boat plus the warrants. So the question is whether or not we want the Eagle Bolt plus the warrants to stay in the portfolio. And uh, honestly, I do because I don't mind buying more of it. Um, we don't have that much of it. That's another thing. We've got, um, we did the math on this the other day. We have 5,000 shares coming to it at a buck. Well, the net, see, the thing is that we didn't pay much for it. We sold these for a buck 30 to 250 puts. So we're paying 120. You know, if this thing gets assigned to us, we're netting in at 120. It doesn't matter if this is 220 now. We'd be idiots to pay 220 because then we're getting out for 30 cents. So why would we do that? So it, the thing is that we have a choice at the moment. We collected 130. We have to pay 220 to get out. That's 90 cents more, right? So we're taking 90 cents out of our pocket in addition to the 130 we collected to, to not buy a eagle. Or we could keep the 130 in our pocket and risk spending as much as 120 to actually own it and not be out of it. So for 30 cents difference, that's our risk. Our risk for 30 cents is that we own, is that we own the new Eagle company. So to me, it means like we may as well own it. If it ends up being 30 cents, then if we double down at 30 cents, we drop our basis from 120 to 75 cents just by doing that. In a new company, that would be debt-free. All right, so, you know, essentially it's going to be a new company, debt-free and reorganized, and then you have to wait for the Baltic price shipping rates to come back. But since they have no debt, what's the big deal? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Then the low rates won't bother them so much. All right, so we don't want to double down on them or do anything with them because we may get uh, forced into owning it at the new shares, and it's going to be a mess to figure out. But after that, we'll have to decide. Cognavian, different, they're not going bankrupt. How are these things down 89 cents? Holy crap, that's a great opportunity to get more. The $5 puts can now be sold for 180, all right? So that's a net of 320 versus our original net that was um, 30405. So we're getting a pretty good drop, 320 significantly below where the stock is now, and we like up long term, and they're not going bankrupt. All right, unless I missed something, but I don't think they are. And again, these are cyclical stocks. Cyclical stocks have cycles where they go bad. And if you don't mind writing out those down cycles, all you can do is keep accumulating. Say, like maybe not this year, maybe next year, maybe two years, maybe five years. At some point, the thing comes back. You know, I mean, if you look at the, if you have a, the 200-year, 500-year perspective on stocks, you'll see cyclical stocks go in cycles. Some cycles are 10-year cycles, some 20-year cycles. Doesn't matter though if you're if you're a long term investor if you're uh, investing the uh, horizon extends out to your retirement is like 20 years away, not a big deal. We had that conversation this morning. We were talking about investing in REITs. 
You don't invest in a REIT to, you know, you don't buy NLY, which is an $11 REIT. You don't buy it and say, oh, well, if it goes below eight, I'm getting out. No, if it goes below eight, I'm buying more. You know, unless something happens, unless something dead happens with management or something like that, you know it's going to go up and down. You know it'll be 16 one time and eight another time. Now it's in the middle of 11. Don't buy at 11 if you don't want to get in. Buy the, you know, wait till the channel low. But, you know, you're buying it for when when uh, the real estate market kicks back, when commercial real estate comes back in vote. Maybe it won't happen this year, next year, or five years from now. And maybe you'll end up owning a lot of NLY. But you know what? Funny, by the time you end up owning a lot of NLY, you'll end up catching the up cycle, right, when you have a lot of it. All right? And the same thing is going to go with the Eagle for us, okay, and for maybe When the cycle comes back, it's going to be a big stock. It'll be a big, ugly red part of our portfolio, but it's going to be a big stock that we hold, and then it comes back and go, holy crap, all right? And I think we did that with Crocs. With Crocs we did it with Crocs. We did it, it was serious. Um, who else did we do it with? Taser, when Taser was falling apart. Um, you know, we, we, we do that because when stocks like get crushed, but for dumb reasons, it's great going, oh, we do the yellow uh, roadway, yellow roadway, we also get crushed on their bankruptcy, we took advantage of that. All right, if you, if you really like the value of something, we're doing with Arrow now, when you like the value of something at a certain point, like I said about the Mercedes, it's like, the $10,000, I'll buy the freaking car. I'll find somebody who wants a convertible Mercedes with 40,000 miles on it. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's driven by an old lady on Sunday. It actually was in Florida. Um, if, you, if you know there's a value, like I know my niece would want it, I know my nephew would want it, I know a lot of people would want the car. So my worst case scenario is I'm like the coolest uncle ever on somebody's birthday. Um, it's, it's a matter of saying, like, you know, what's your fallback position and what's the worst thing that's going to happen if you end up owning this stock? And yeah, it's like, of course, obviously we bought a few stocks that have actually gone bankrupt and been unrecoverable, but compare that to the times we get 10 baggers out of them, it's not worth it. Anyone we can still have all participants chat. What does that mean, Mike? I don't know what that means. Anyway, well, what do you mean by all participant chat? I can't see anyone else. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys aren't commenting to all panels? No, I'll tell you, nobody's actually, I'm sorry. Some people were privately commenting, and I forgot to tell people not to do that earlier, so that's one thing. But people are mostly commenting now to all panelists, but nobody's commenting. I'm just chatting. There's only like, uh, there's not many people here at Friday. None of you guys are ever here on Friday anyway. Um, this is not a day, oh, shoot, I'll chat with them. There's only 24 people in the whole thing. I had some pathetic intent. I didn't advertise it either. I didn't advertise this on uh, any of our things. I didn't push out an alert because we're just doing this to test the chat, which is working fantastically now, by the way. Everything seems to be going great. I can only see me as a panelist and no chat. What do you mean? You can't see the chat window? You're chatting in the chat window. Nobody's chatting. I want to get that across. Nobody's actually saying anything. But, but the point of this was, like, Mike just commented privately. He needs to do his comment to all participants. Although I think he's really just commenting something about Boston, so. <laughs> you can't get the sardines in Cambridge. Yeah, no, I, I, no, we're having fun food for the kids. I'm going to have sushi, but other than that, we're not. Well, we're having sushi on t tonight, and then tomorrow night we have the party. So we'll be food the party. And Sunday we're going to go to Cambridge for brunch, so feel free to suggest something there. I think sardines is good for lunch, though, okay? Sandrines, whatever. Um, oh, you're saying for lunch, though. Okay, maybe we'll try that at Sandrine. Because, yes, I am going to be looking for a good lunch in Cambridge on uh, Sunday. <laughs> Greg's here. Okay, good. I don't have a comment. Uh, no, all participants in the um, send to in the chat thing. Greg, you have to have that. Oh, Goldman added ADX. Okay, there's another one we keep buying. Okay, so ADX is another good example. We keep, whenever it goes low, we just buy it. But that's about having um, Sandrines. Okay, I remember that. 
So um, you just got to keep buying the damn thing. You know, if you if you have a conviction of something, you, you make it a bigger part of your portfolio when it gets lower, not small. You don't run away from them every time they have a dip. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'm about done with this thing. Uh, maybe, okay, we've got some talking about that. And last chance for questions. Everybody's chatting now about, everybody's chatting about who's in chat, but no questions. All right, so, uh, you know, but like I said, I mean, 24 people actually is not so bad because Friday was dead. Friday was dead in chat anyway. Greg says, I have host, host presenter, and all panelists. That's weird. Maybe it's because you have some special, uh, you're like the, the chat supervisor. Maybe it's different. Yeah. All right. We'll have to figure that out, Greg, but um, I can always re relay any message you have for people, but it would be good if you could chat. So you can't, in this window, pick send to all participants. Do I have those choices? Oh, I have the choices you're talking about, but then I have to scroll down a little bit and it shows me all. Below all attendees and all panelists, says all participants. Okay, let's see. Am I recommending a new hub entry at that price? Absolutely. I'm 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 strongly considering in the uh I'm not considering doing anything today, but I am saying that I would gladly for Hubnavian at this price, if you can get a dollar eighty plus for the um and you can, this is a bad price, I bet you, for the January short puts for the five dollar put. Well let, let's take a look. I'll show you what the lot is. H O V. So we go down to January 2016. The $5 puts are, oh, they're not a dollar. Hey, get the thing. So, so it's not as good as it's showing us because it's showing us as a negative, like the worst case scenario on the price. So if we actually go to sell it, it's probably going to be more like a dollar sixty. That's a big difference. It's hard to read. You always have to keep things in context. Out of a small little stock, $1.20 you know, is a lot. Um, it's dollar sixty and ending it for two forty. Two forty is uh, no wait 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 three forty. No, I wouldn't do it for three forty. For three twenty, I'd do it three forty. I'm not saving enough to make it worth it. I'd rather sell the four dollar put for ninety cents and I net in at three ten. So I'd be a little happier there. All right. So if I was going to do a new trade on Hubnavian, because think about this: we sell these guys for ninety cents. Sell single, which is what we originally sold the buy for. If you sell this guy for ninety cents, you collect nine hundred bucks for selling ten. Your buying power effect is net four is four twenty seven. So you're collecting two times what you're using in buying power. Your return on buying power is two hundred percent, and all you're doing is promising to buy up maybe in the net three ten. When it's now three ninety, so another uh, eighty cents off is uh, um, well, speaking twenty. Uh, call it twenty cents. So it's twenty percent off. All right, and then but then you have to think about my downside consequences. So okay, if I have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, my allocation block for five thousand dollars. So. I certainly don't want to have more than a half allocation of Hubnavian if it puts me now. But I think it's true. So let's say um, at 310, if I can find 500 shares of Hubnavian at 310, then I'm into $1,500 out of a $5,000 allocation block. Well, that's not so bad. Even if you lose the whole $1,500, it's a hundred thousand dollar portfolio risking one point five percent. So it's not terrible. That's your additional allocation. So for five, you'll collect four hundred and fifty bucks. Your worst case scenario is you'll end up owning them for net three ten. All right? And and, and that's again, it's a one X. So you got four fifty in pocket. Your worst case scenario is you spend fifteen hundred dollars to buy more, but then at three ten. What would you do? You would turn around and sell some three dollar calls, which say would be the equivalent of selling four dollar calls now. Well, look at that. That knocks off another forty cents. These are only January's too. So if you sold, for example, well, in fact if you got to two fifteen, let's say you sold 
these are 90 cents. So let's say if you got it assigned at 310, that you would then sell $3 calls to 90 cents. That drops your basis already from 310 to uh, 220. And then you would sell the 250 put for what the 350 puts are probably selling for, which is 50 cents. So then you'd knock off from, from 220, you knock off another 50, now you'd have a 170, and if it's put to you at three, you'd average in 470 divided by two is 235. So now the question is, what you're saying is, are you willing to own a thousand shares of what made me in for 235? That's almost 50 to set off the current price. And that's still at a thousand shares at 235 is only uh, $2,500 that will still only have you at half an allocation block in your portfolio. So even though you're starting with a third of an allocation block with $1,500 commitment, your long-term commitment really is that you'll end up with a 50% allocation with a thousand shares. A thousand shares right now is worth $3,900. You're gonna buy them for $2,250. So that makes, that's making a good spread. In other words, if you're making a spread, if you're setting up a position where your worst case scenario is something that you're going to be disappointed not to get, like I'm going to be pissed off if I don't end up owning half of 240 now that I have it in my head, or 220, then that means it was a good trade. That means that, that's a good trade, okay? So my worst case scenario, is, so now my worst case, now my best case scenario in my mind is I get to own half maybe and a thousand shares of half maybe and for 235 or whatever the hell the number was. So I am, my worst case is ending is only twenty three hundred dollars for for a thousand shares of maybe. That's my my best case. I want that to happen. I want how they can go low. Okay. My worst case now is I only get to keep four hundred and fifty bucks. So what I'm really allocating here is is down the road. I'm I'm really only allocating twenty five hundred bucks to this position, and and obviously with twenty five hundred bucks it means that margin wise I'm only allocating twelve hundred bucks there at worst. All right, so a non-portfolio margin account, I'm allocating 1200 bucks to 2016 of my margin buying power. I'm collecting 450 up front, so I'm collecting 30-something percent right now of an allocation I'm not even making. And I'm going to be pissed off if that's all I end up with. <laughs> that's a good spread. So what's my, what's my thing about up maybe? Of course you got to do that. Why would you not do that? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you not sell these puts for ninety cents? That makes no sense. If you don't own this position, if you're not in, if you don't have, if you're not over heavy in real estate stocks, and you have a spot in your portfolio, this is a fantastic way to fill it, but in the right proportion. All right, so back here, da, 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 huh? if you have a hundred thousand to twenty, your portfolio should be possible. Ah, oh, Patrick, well. <clears throat> If you have a hundred thousand and you want to follow something, I would I would it's still the same strategy though. I would still take seventy-five thousand for the long-term portfolio strategy, twenty-five thousand for the uh, short-term portfolio strategy. You want to always have a short-term, long-term balance. You want to have trades to set and forget, like this up maybe but clearly a long-term trade. You set and forget. The thing is what you have to learn is not you since you only have a hundred thousand, you're trying to do the same kind of uh, split. You just want to not participate in the expensive ones. That's all. So when we buy, when we're buying, a, a, when we're selling puts on um, ISRG for three hundred bucks, you say no, that's not for me. It's too big. You stick to the things that are like, you know, twenty five bucks and less. That you have the margin and ability to uh, make an allocation for. If it doesn't fit in your allocation block, it doesn't fit. All right. Meanwhile, in chat, always ask. So I say, hey, is it is it for a small portfolio? You know, any obviously anything in the long-term portfolio, if you can divide it by five, it works for you, right? But um, that's a conservative long-term strategy. The short-term portfolio follow aggressive short-term strategy, um, but we're also trying to balance them out, you know, with the long-term fix. All right, so the trick is, and again, it's like, I, it, it always goes back to, I, I think it's a terrible thing you should never, just follow the picks. The idea is to learn what we're doing so that you can set up your own portfolio. I don't want everyone to have the same portfolio. That's a terrible idea. Okay, it's, it's a diversity of picks. It's finding things that fit for you. You should be, I mean, one of the most useful things Kramer does, he does that, am I diversified? Pick with the audience, uh, every 
once a week he does this thing, Am I Diversified? And Am I Diversified is trying to put forth, like, your, your portfolio has to be allocated. And, and you should have, with a $100,000 portfolio, you should be in $5,000 blocks in your portfolio. 5000 you have 200000 buying power, but you should be sticking to what you have in cash. So you should be allocating $5,000 blocks for your buying power allocation and making trades. So your initial entry on most of your trades is going to be 2500 to 5000 at most 5000 I'm sorry, scratch that, sorry, 1500 to 2500 It's going to be one-third, one-quarter to one-half of, of your full allocation. Unless you should put on anything. So if a trade doesn't fit that, it doesn't fit that. But then within that context, you have to stay diversified on your allocation. So obviously, we take trades that are balancing a whole portfolio. It, it turns out that for whatever reason, you've got a bunch of trades that end up in a certain sector, you've got to be careful about that too and just not overweight yourself in one sector or another and or in one direction or another. You have to be conscious of these things. But that's the thing. It's much more important to learn how how these things work so that you can do it and balance your own stuff than to, than to follow things because you can't follow everything. You know, we, we've got five portfolios out there. Not, you know, nobody's following all that. Um, the idea is just to show people different ways you can set up portfolios and different ways you can trade. The butterfly portfolio is also, that's a $100,000 portfolio. That one's really good, but it's only uh, meant to make a, a regular steady 20% a year. So it depends what you're looking to do also. It's not aggressive. It's just Let's make some money, you know, boom. You know, we are betting against ourselves here. All right, KDH and Hub, would you split up 50-50? Yes, they would. Always good to not have all your eggs in one basket. So uh, some KDH and some Hub maybe. Uh, would Charlie better? I like Hub maybe better. They're just concentrated in the Northeast. They are out to other places, but um, the bottom line is that, you know, the Northeast of the United States is very, very strong, very good with real estate. We're totally out of land. You know, there's nowhere else to go. They're really, they're building like homes on the sides of mountains. They're knocking the top off the mountains to make room for homes. There's nothing left. So, uh, you know, they, so I'm even sitting on land and the land is good. And taxes are like 20% a year. It's, yeah, 20% a year is good. I'm saying, you know, you, why do you have to be aggressive when you can steadily make money? You know, that, that's, uh, we'll take a quick look at that right now. Let's finish up today. I never get these done on time. Um, Look at the butterfly portfolio. We just kicked Caesar out, which was technically went bad on us. But nonetheless, we're up 22.6%. So we gained since we kicked Caesar out, not because we kicked Caesar out, but, you know, since we kicked Caesar out, that was being a drag on the portfolio. Now it's getting back to its normal path of gaining about 1% a week. All right, so it's up 22.6% now. And, uh, and, and also, look at the commitment level here. We've got um, 75000 in cash. Um, and what does it say about uh, uh, liquidation margin? We're using we're using no margin. This thing uses very very strict margin requirements too. So we're not using margin because everything is covered. We're using only twenty five percent of our cash. Yet we've made twenty two thousand dollars. All right. So so I, I want to make that clear also. It's like we're making twenty two thousand dollars on twenty five thousand. We're not using seventy five thousand dollars of our cash. Avengers. And again, obviously, because of, uh, of ordinary margin, you really have 200000 spent. We're just adding positions. I, I don't like this portfolio, frankly, because it's such a pain in the ass to like, deal with all the little intricacies of all the positions. But so I end up, like, I, as I complain often in member chat, we spend so much time talking about this portfolio because it's got more complicated positions than others that I loathe to put new ones in here. But as you can see, though, you don't need to allocate very much money to make a tremendous amount of money using these kind of positions. So I, I certainly recommend having a couple of these because they're fantastic. Um, it, it's just a question of learning how to manage it correctly. All questions at the expiration. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, at the, at, at the expiration, of course, you're going to have questions, but it just, um, this, it's, dry. it's not that it specifically goes back and forth. Like people ask like 10 questions in, in, in a day on the same position just because what if you do this or what about that, what about that? And I try to say to people, leave it alone. <laughs> it doesn't need to be traded that often. Just leave it alone and it will balance out. And, and finally, we gave up on Caesars after going way off track 
And uh, yeah, we probably should have killed and pulled the plug sooner. And in fact, at one point I did say for those low 15, we could kill it, but we didn't, we failed to do it, and then it got a little worse on us. Um, that's all it is, though. If you, if you run this portfolio and you make sure your things are on track, and when they get off track, you get out, and you say, okay, this one's done making me money, I'll go to something else, that's the way to do it. We're going to add, I think, two more positions in the next couple of weeks on these guys. I mentioned OIH. I think I do like OIH enough to put it in here. Um, that was in yesterday's post that we talked about the OIH play, and I, I will officially add it next week, especially if somebody reminds me on our regular Tuesday webinar. I think that's going to be a good thing to do. And uh, that's all it is. So, uh, uh, you know, as it stands now, this is making that 22% a year that we want to make, and um, we're not being more ambitious than that. But I just want I, I got to point out, so I think I forget to you sometimes, we're making 22% of $100,000 using only $25,000, making like 100% on the $25,000 we're actually using. And the reason for that is because if there is a black swan, if something terrible happens, if, they, if one of these stocks blows out of our position, it's so incredibly unlikely, but if something like that does happen, like if J.P. Morgan went bankrupt tomorrow, you know, we can recover from it. All right, so that's what this is about. This is a very, 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 very conservative way to make some very nice returns. And I love this portfolio. And especially if you don't have time to watch the markets and you just want to set up positions, come back a week later, see how they do it. This is the greatest thing in the world. All right, but please don't ask me 100 questions. <laughs> All right. Greg says, sorry I can't chat to all. Please mention to people that they should email any issues to admin at philstockworld.com. Uh, I already posted a member chat to do so, but I couldn't hurt to mention it again. Greg, I have a solution for you. Come in as a guest, and then you can chat to people. How about that? <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I will think of you when I'm drinking, <laughs> and hopefully I'll be here on Monday. All right? Take care, guys. I'm going to head back to chat.